Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session. Um, some years ago, uh, Chava Alberstein, who is a very famous Israeli singer, got an honorary doctorate at our institute at Weizmann, and she gave a very moving short speech in which she said that one of the amazing things about scientists is that they keep on learning uh, all their lives, which many of us do. I mean, I, I explained to my grandchildren that what I do really all day long is learn new things. Um, but not many people know that there are scientists who work on learning. Of course, there are also fields in uh, education and so on. But in the hard sciences, there's also learning. And this session is about learning. And we have two uh, wonderful speakers, both of whom worked under Rafi Levine. I just, uh, I didn't know that you also did your postdoc under him. Um, our first speaker is uh, Tali Tishbi from the Hebrew University, who comes more from the side of computer science. And then we will have Todd, who will come from the side of chemistry. And I'm pretty sure we'll be learning a lot of stuff. So Tali, please. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, I haven't been talking to theoretical chemists for some time, but uh, I really enjoyed everything I saw so far, and I realized that this is really my origin, my, some of my origins. I mean, I'm a physicist, but Rafi is certainly my, one of my origins <laughs> in many ways. And um, I, I, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we now call the, the deep learning revolution, which is uh, uh, the latest phase of uh, what started as artificial intelligence uh, actually after Turing, uh, more or less in the 50s, uh, and went through essentially two uh, major phase transitions. So the first phase between, let's say, the 50s and the 80s was based on the idea that uh, intelligence or human intelligence can be mimicked by algorithms. Essentially, it's one manifestation of the church Turing uh, theories. Essentially, our brain is nothing more than an algorithm. Therefore, we can just uh, program a machine to do what we do. And essentially, in order to do this, all we have to do is ask people how they do things, and for example, how they see, or how they understand language, or how they walk, and we'll program it. And as naive as it sounds, this was essentially the, phase, the first phase of artificial intelligence in the 60s and 50s, where people really believed that they can build what we call expert systems. Just ask the expert and program his knowledge. And of course, this never worked, <laughs> never really worked well. In the 80s, uh, right after I finished my PhD, more or less, uh, there was really another revolution where the idea of uh, the same problems of artificial intelligence, I mean, mimicking humans in everything they do, uh, was uh, joined with statistics, which was actually there already in, in engineering, in pattern recognition, in signal processing, in many other fields, of course, in physics and chemistry and, and other sciences. But so the idea of actually, instead of really programming the rules, let's program the learning rules, which is essentially the meta-algorithm which allows us to learn from data. This came out in the mid-'80s, together with uh, actually the reborn of an older idea, which is the idea of neural networks. Uh, and that's actually, I got attracted actually to the statistical mechanics of neural networks right there in the mid-'80s, coming from dynamical systems and, and a little bit of statistical physics. This was exactly the kind of thing I wanted to do. And uh, eventually, during the 80s, uh, neural network started to show some signs of, uh, of being able to do things, which I'll show you in a minute. But eventually, the, the, the strictly speaking neural network went down again. I'll come back to this. And re-emerged in the, the late 2000s, about 10, 000, uh, 10 years ago, in a new form, which is now known as deep learning, which is essentially the same neural networks that we knew already from the 50s and 60s, but in a, a new version, which is on much larger scale and much larger depth. And I'll, so essentially, we are now in a phase which we call the deep learning phase of machine learning, which is uh, surprisingly to everyone, including the people who invented it, a lot more successful than we could imagine. It's actually, and it's really technologically turning uh, the world around. So among other things, of course, people are using machine learning in, in, in chemistry in, in, the, in, the, in the simplest possible way. Essentially, let's say I want to classify a material as being toxic or not toxic. Uh, 
Uh, so I just give you an, a, lo a lot of molecules, represent them somehow to a machine, and label them as toxic or non-toxic, and hope that somehow the machine or the, the rule behind this uh, will be extracted, even if we cannot really tell exactly what makes it toxic or, or not. So this is the classical classification problem. And, and, uh, and as you can imagine, I mean, there is something quite, uh, quite puzzling about this, this way of moving from what we call design thinking, I mean, like, let's say drug design or anything like this, and, and, and make much more of it by, by machines, which in many cases we don't really understand. So again, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a mechanical process, more or less, which has been industrialized to a very large scale uh, by many, many different industries, including the chemistry industry, and I'm sure you all know about it and hear about it. So there's nothing special uh, about it, only that it's, it seemed to take over uh, many of our uh, creative thinking in some sense, and that's really the reason why uh, many of us don't like it. And essentially, when we think about machine learning, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is what we call curve fitting. <laughs> I mean, essentially, we all know for, since Gauss, more or less, and that we can fit uh, functions to data, essentially by doing some sort of regression. And uh, there's nothing new in the fact that we can uh, tune parameters and eventually get very nice interpolations. And, and of course, let's say if, this is, if the dots here are, are my training data, or my, my, my God, or empirical data, uh, I can fit all sorts of functions. For example, I can fit a linear polynomial or, or a higher order polynomial through these points. And of course, the higher the order of the polynomial, the, the better the fit is going to be. Uh, but at some point, we know that we, we, we are going, we're going to do what we call overfitting. And that's something which is really quite essential here. So let's say that I actually take a polynomial of the degree, which is the number of points, I'm going to fit all the points perfectly. Uh, but as you can imagine, this polynomial is going to oscillate crazily between the points and outside of the points, so it's going to have what we call very poor generalization. So essentially, one of the things that was, was realized in the 80s already, that the issue about learning is generalization. I mean, it's out of training performance. It's not just fitting data. If it was just fitting data, then we could all uh, get uh, very large tables of everything we know, and, and this is nothing that we can call intelligence in any sense. So extracting rules in some sense is some sort of fitting simple rules to data, not complicated rules to data. But to a large extent, uh, uh, most of what we now call machine learning, or at least before deep learning, uh, is, is fitting data. I mean, it's, it's some curve, very, very fancy curve fitting. And uh, in that sense, uh, there's really nothing new here. I mean, we just do it on a larger scale and in very high dimension, but uh, the fact that we can fit functions to data is not a surprise to anyone. Is it really learning anything? Is there any intelligence in it? So obviously, the, this, that way, there's not. So, so we know that if we just fit parameters to data, let's say polynomials to, to these points, uh, the number of data points should be of the order of the number of parameters, at least in order to make sense and, and be reliable, reliable statistically. And if we have, if getting to the same order, the, the fit is completely arbitrary. Uh, the, as you can see, for example, in this example, you can actually choose the function class maybe better. For, in this case, for example, I would choose a sine function or something like this, which seems like a much more reasonable choice. So the selection of the function class, or what we now call, usually call the hypothesis class, is a very important uh, aspect of what I call the old machine learning. So essentially, what type of functions we want to fit to our data. So polynomial, in this case, doesn't look like the natural choice. Maybe a, a sine or a cosine or something, a Fourier transform will do better, and so on. So as, as silly as it sounds, this slide is essentially all of what we call the theoretical machine learning. Not all, there sounds are some more details. Neural networks is a, an old idea, I mean, it started in the 40s already, which comes actually from the attempt to mimic biology. And we know that neurons everywhere in our, in, in organisms, uh, are, are very special cells in the sense that they tend to connect to other cells. 
And, and they don't do it for any metabolic reasons. It's not because they need more oxygen or more sugar or anything like this. They do it for something completely different, which we now know to, to name as information. Essentially, they connect to each other because there's something in the communication between them which really attracts them to each other. So there's something very fundamental in the way neurons connect to each other which is directly related to this elusive notion of information. And uh, already in the 40s, we, we, we mean it. We, we, people build a uh, McCulloch and Fitz in 42 already, build this artificial uh, or, or logical kind of neuron which is essentially, rather than trying to simulate all the complicated uh, biochemistry or, or biology that goes in a neuron, let's just simulate it or mimic it by a dot product of some arbitrary weights, which we call here Ws, which are essentially tunable parameters, by the inputs, which are essentially those neurons that didn't neuron connect to. And we know that a neuron is highly nonlinear function in the sense that if the member, member potential is above a certain threshold, it fires, it has this spike, or it has some highly nonlinear activity, and we can mimic this by essentially comparing the dot products of those weights with the threshold with the level which is essentially the potential level of the, the input to cells uh, and, and to put it to some sort of, some sort of a nonlinear function like a, just a sine function or a sigmoid function or any, any other nonlinearity. And this particular gate, which is really very simple, simple minded, essentially what it is is putting some sort of a hyperplane uh, through my space of access, through my data, and separating the two sides of the hyperplane. So it's one on one side and zero on the other side, and I can smooth this hyperplane by some sort of a smooth nonlinearity. This is the neuron. So uh, neural networks, which is really what I, I want to tell you about, essentially this very simple idea that instead of using one neuron, let's stack them together. And because one neuron is really implementing a very simple function, just linearly separable data. Uh, but if I want to to capture much more complicated relationship, I can do it, and it's probably universal in some sense, by, by stacking at least three layers of such neurons connected to each other. And uh, this was really the state of the art, more or less in the 80s. We started to connect those neurons one to the other, and all those arrows, all those connections are essentially adjustable weights, which we can constrain in various ways, but essentially these are the weights of the machine. And you see already that if I have many, many neurons like this, the number of parameters or the number of weights is going to increase quite dramatically. And, and, and actually, it's going to be, sorry, this is not mine. Oh, OK. So, uh, so this was really the state of the art. And you see essentially how we, we apply it. I mean, we take some sort of representation of, let's say, a drug together with other features like genome or, or whatever. And we just pass it very naively through such layers and train the weights, or adjust the weights, in the most stupid way you can imagine, which is essentially, let's try to force the function to go through the data points by a gradient descent on the parameters. So gradient descent, I just do slow, slow changes in my parameters in a direction which will improve that, what we call the training error which means fitting the data. So I have data, I have labels on the other side, and I'm trying to fit them by adjusting the parameter. This sounds like a very stupid idea. Uh, actually, it's not, not very sophisticated. And actually, we don't even calculate the gradient. We calculate a stochastic version of the gradient, some sort of a noisy gradient, because we don't really calculate the full gradient on all my data, but only on some what we call mini batches or fragments of the data. And that's called stochastic gradient descent. And surprise, surprise, these things work like magic. So essentially what happens, again, here is this uh, quite interesting history of, of the field. I mean, born in the 40s uh, by Minsky and Papert, then suggested as a pattern recognition device by Frank Rosenblatt already in 1959, who actually envisioned the whole story already, you call it the multi-layer perception. But then Minsky and Papert, two very clever uh, mathematicians actually in, at MIT, uh, proved him and practically in a very famous book called Perceptrons, which is a, an exact and very nice example of a completely rigorous work which is completely wrong, in the sense that the, the, the punchline that these things can never work was completely wrong. 
what happens in the 80s is that some people who were actually psychologists and didn't really care much about the mathematics of Minsky uh, uh, tried it again in this new version of uh, back propagation, which essentially let's calculate the error, update the weights layer by layer using the, the rule, the chain rule of derivatives, which is somehow, uh, of course, Minsky knew about it, Minsky and Papa, but they thought that we're going to get stuck in the local minima of this error function very quickly, and therefore this will never be practical. So already in the 80s, with this back propagation idea, the thing started to take over, to take off and actually showed some signs of feasibility to do interesting things, but then, Came Vapnik, who was essentially a Russian mathematician who came from, uh, from Russia in 89. Actually, I was there when he, in the first conference, he came to the States and, and showed us that there is a much more mathematically rigorous way of doing these things, essentially, in what we now call support vector machines and kernel machines, which are essentially a neural network with a tunable or learnable function, which we call the kernel of the, of the function. For about 10 years, this completely dominated machine learning. But then, as I said, in, in the late 2000s, uh, Hinton and Lyakun and a few other people started to st were stubborn enough to try this network in this new version, many, many different layers. And when the layers got to 10 and 20 and 30 and hundreds, and now they're actually way into the thousand number of layers, suddenly this stupid machine started to win all the competitions in pattern recognition. It started with object recognition is vision, and then speech recognition, and then control, and then, uh, you know, problems like protein folding and many, many other things that were considered very difficult. Actually, they, they took the error, essentially, at order of magnitude, better in performance or even more in some cases. And in many, many cases, this brings us to the human performance, let's say, in face recognition, for example, or in speech recognition. So this is, of course, very interesting because it, it sparks huge industry, including in chemistry. But for theoreticians like me, this was... Uh, Quite frustrating, actually, it was good news for me because I thought about this problem a long time ago, I mean, in the 80s already, but suddenly it became on such a large scale. I mean, so the one thing that happened between 80, the 80s and the 2000s is that the size of the problem in terms of the size of the input grew up by three orders of magnitude. So essentially we moved from, let's say, objects or I images that had hundreds of pixels, hundreds of pixels, to images that have tens of millions of pixels. High resolution, which means that the whole thing has now become highly statistical, but a, a very big puzzle. So one of the things that I've been doing in the last uh, five years is trying to develop some sort of theory of why and how deep learning works so well. And I, I'm going to show you some aspect of the theory. I don't have enough time to really describe it to you. But surprisingly, it puts this problem back into the realm of statistical mechanics and information theory, which are those large-scale theories which really know how to deal with what we call typical behavior and not worst case behavior. And this in some sense for the computer scientists is a very sad story because they work very hard on all sorts of bounds that are worst case. So essentially we combine a complete shift in what we call statistical learning theory. I'm not going to describe it here. But essentially from worst case bounds we move to typical behavior. And instead of being what we call problem independent or distribution independent bounds but highly sensitive to the hypothesis class, actually turn it to problem-dependent or data-dependent bounds, but highly insensitive to the algorithm of the hypothesis class. So this is a 90-degree rotation of the theory. At the same time, this large scale is bringing us to, to information theory again. Of course, information theory has been my favorite uh, uh, toy for a long time. And information theory is really the tool to deal with relevant structures and typical behavior on large scale. But this is not enough. The really interesting aspect of the theory or the understanding of deep learning is that this stupid stochastic gradient descent algorithm is actually playing miracles with the structure of the network. And this SGD, the stochastic gradient descent, which essentially pushes some sort of distribution into an equilibrium, a Gibbs distribution, or at least locally Gibbs distribution, which eventually gives us this, the, the op essentially optimal performance of these networks. So essentially, I'm going to just give you the gist of it in a few seconds. What we do in a rather elaborated story is map this network into a Markov chain of representation. So if you think about the input as x, millions of pixels of an image, and, and the label as y, let's say one bit, is it me or not me in the image, or something like this. It's a lot simpler variable. Essentially, what happens in these layers 
is that each layer is representing, is only markably dependent on the previous one, can be calculated from the previous one. So there is a Markov chain representation. And somehow, miraculously, the last layer is capable of predicting the label correctly. So how is this transformation happens? And uh, I'm, I'm just going to, to give you really the, the very short story here. Essentially what happens, according to this theory, is that information is squeezed out of the data and reshuffled and integrated in a new way in each layer. And eventually only the relevant information for the label, which is highly distributed in the original image, I say, there's no one bit in the pixel of my picture that can tell me that this is me. I have to somehow integrate it from all the picture, or all the molecule, or whatever it is that you're trying to label. Eventually, it's squeezed away by the stochastic nature of the process. So in order to convince you, essentially, the way I, I think about it, oh, I'm sorry, this is wrong here, but ignore this uh, label. Uh, this came from the other talk I have to give in now. <laughs> but essentially, uh, I can think about the network as, as if there is an encoder of the data which is the map from the input to the layer, and a decoder of the data from the layer to the, to the label. And now my, my really striking argument, which is rigorous to some extent at least, is that out of this huge number of parameters, millions of parameters in this, in this, in this uh, picture, so of, oh, we are already out of the domain of curve fitting because the number of parameters in these models, orders of magnitude, three or four or five orders of magnitude, more than the number of points. So obviously we are not doing curve fitting. We're doing something else, and we need to think about it in an entirely different way. And uh, what I argue, and of course it's still highly debatable, and there's a lot of argument in the literature right now about it, that essentially only two number matters asymptotically. It's the mutual information that the layer has about the input, and the mutual information that the layer has about the output. Two numbers only. So this is a very dramatic simplification of the problem. And let me just show you why, how it works. So here's a nice simulation. What you see here are these two numbers. How much information X has about the, la the, the layer, with the layer, and how much information the layer has about the label. And this is what I call the information plan representation. And eventually, what you see here is 100 different neural networks trained on the same problem with random initial conditions and random examples, set of examples. It's a very small problem. You see that the entropy information is bounded by 12 which means that there are only 12 bits of inputs here, so it's small small problem, but, and only one bit of label, that's what I care about. But if you look at the dynamics, and that's where we go back to dynamics, of course, of these points when I train it, you see something which is remarkably, you know, statistical physics. I mean, in some sense, you see all this nice jitter. You see quite a few things which, are quite, which require explanation. First of all, all those different networks which are very different from each other, the parameters are completely different, just like the molecules in the air of this room. But somehow, these two numbers, the mutual information about the input and the mutual information about the output, concentrate. They look very, very similar, and I can tell you, and I can prove it, that the larger the problem, the sharper the concentration. So there's something nice about these two numbers. This look, they look very much like all the parameters in physics, like magnetization, or like energy, or like entropy. They are well-defined when I go to very high, large systems. Everything else somehow seems to be averaging out. What you see here in different colors are the different layers of this 100 repetition. The top blue there is the first hidden layer closest to the input. So this has the maximum information about both the output and the input. And when I go through this Markov chain, I'm losing information and the higher layers. So up to this point, which is around 300 cycles of the data, this number of epochs, everything seems to be more or less as you expect. I mean, the information about the label goes up. At this point, which I call the inflection point, or something strange happened. Essentially, at this point, the labels of the data are completely determined. But I then start the interesting part. There's a slow diffusion, which actually, it's much slower. You see the number of epochs go from three, 300 to 10,000. And essentially, all the layers climb up, which means better information about the label, but also go to the left, which means that they forget the, out, the input. They forget the details. And in essence, this is what we argue is the story of deep learning. So this is the average of these clouds, which is what I'm allowed to average because they seem to concentrate very well. And you see these very interesting trajectories. From A to C, the last layer is essentially memorizing the data. And from C to E, which is the most interesting part of the story, 
It's something completely different from, 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 uh, from curve fitting. This is the noise induced by the stochastic gradients forcing us to a Gibbs distribution in terms of the, 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 the presentation of distribution of the weights, condition on the training error. So it's exponential in training error locally. And this Gibbs distribution is eventually forcing us to forget information about the input. Now I argue mathematically, I'm not going to do it here, that this forgetting of information is actually very important. I mean, so first of all, this, we know that these two values of, of the information concentrate whenever I can write the probability of the pattern as some sort of a product of locally in, conditionally independent terms. And this is just self-averaging in the same sense that entropy is self-averaging. So if, if the patterns have, let's say, a local Hamiltonian, as, as, as Dorit called it, or, as a, or a graphical model with just finite degree of connections, or, or a you know, Markov chain, or, or Markov random field, or a hidden Markov model, all these kind of things, which are precisely the assumptions behind the data that we train, those two numbers are going to concentrate simply by the law of large numbers. And those of you who are quick enough can see that the first one is actually trivial. The second one has the same nature of a partition function, and it's averages exactly because partition functions, log partition function average. So it's very clear why these two numbers average, and from that I actually get this very dramatic change in the way we think about learning, instead of being dominated by the dimension of the hypothesis class over the number of examples, it's dominated by how much I can compress the pattern or the mutual information between the pattern and my layer, and this, any bit of compression of this last layer is equivalent to multiplying the data by two. So this is a very dramatic effect. Now, I, 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 uh, where it becomes really interesting, is that we actually have a theory that explains where these layers converge to. And essentially, if you look at this plane, information about input versus information about output, there's this solid line there, the, the, which is essentially a wall. Nothing can pass this line. This line is, 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 a, is a type of what we call information theory, rate, rate distortion function, or it's actually, if you want, a thermodynamic limit of, which depends on the rule, but on nothing else. And what I want to emphasize here that Essentially, what we argue is that this compression due to the stochastic gradient is pushing all the layers to this optimal line, and this optimal line depends only on the rule and not on anything else, not on the architecture. The dynamics of how it moves into this line is, of course, highly dependent on the architecture, but not, nothing else. And I want to convince you this is actually what happens. So essentially, first of all, we know that if we, we have less data, so what you see here are exactly the same plots again, but the color represents the number of epochs of the time. And you see that if you don't have enough data, the first phase, which is really getting to this green line of maximum information about the input, is actually very common, even if I have only 5% of the data. But if I don't have enough data, this compression phase is going to plunge me down. Remember, the information about the label is essentially generalization error, is how much I actually generalize out of my sample. So here is a very interesting dynamical challenge which requires some sort of physics. Okay, so then again, the, the way we, we actually see how what happens here is that we look at the gradients, how those gradients of the error behave. And we see that during the first 300 epochs in this case, you see here the mean and the standard deviation of the gradient per weight, you see a very clean gradient. The mean is about two others magnitude larger than the standard deviation. This is what I call a high signal to noise ratio gradient. But at this 300 point, something strange happens. Essentially, what I know what happens, is that an error saturates, essentially you fit the data. But then the fluctuations of the gradients, which are essentially due to the changes in the background or the irrelevant components of the data, take over. And here you're doing diffusion. And if you look just at the magnitude of the weights in a log log plot, you see this very nicely. During the first phase, I have a linear growth of the weights, which means a drift, and during the second phase, I have a square root or even a sub-square root increase of the weight, which means diffusion. Now, this is uh, the whole story, in my opinion. What actually happens is that this diffusion, and I don't want to get any details here, essentially is very large in the irrelevant variables of the data, and therefore, those that don't affect the error, so I'm doing a random walk in the subspace of the data, so there's a very low dimension, which I call the relevant dimension, which is well protected. I'm not supposed to change the parameters there. But in most, almost always all other directions, and this is really the benefit of the high dimension, I'm doing this very slow diffusion, which eventually behave like noise, 
So it's a, it's a winner process on the weights when multiplied by the previous layer, look like Gaussian noise in, large, in the large n limit, which suppress my signal to noise of the irrelevant representation. So this is a rigorous proof, doesn't depend on anything else, on any, any way of measuring information, which really tells you that this stochastic gradient descent is really mostly about forgetting the irrelevant details. Okay, so of course now I can tell you many other stories about, first of all, how general it is. See, and a completely different problem, by the way, still a small problem, and you see exactly the same picture. Information goes up and then goes to the left, and you see that this transition to this compression phase is exactly at the transition between high signal to noise gradient and low signal to noise gradient. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a complete story, but now actually the interesting part happens. So first of all, we can prove that the whole thing is really a Langevin dynamics which pushed me to some local Gibbs distribution in the error, and this local Gibbs distribution plays exactly, using base rule essentially, to this optimal compression. And what we actually see indeed, that the, that the network actually converge, so this is uh, just to convince you this is the case, the blue line is this optimal theoretical line which I can calculate only from the problem, and the errors uh, on this uh, uh, Red, red process are where the layers of this network end eventually, and you see that they end not in one point, in a very specific location on this line. So of course there's a whole theory why it happens and when it can happen and so on, but essentially this compression of the last hidden layer is the thing that represents for, that is important, that is really, in that sense this is an optimal learning machine. If, if it's actually pushing you to this information button like bound, Nothing can do better eventually. So maybe this is why those machines are so successful, but now there comes really a, a very interesting list of questions, which, so I'm going to skip a lot of things. So first of all, why do the layers actually help us? So this is a very simple experiment. We train the same problem, assume the same, the same rule, on, on different networks with one hidden layer, two hidden layers, up to six hidden layers. And if you look at the colors again, look, they move from dark, dark purple to, to yellow. In the one hidden layer, which is a much simpler model, which is the principle capable of learning the rule, I get a very slow convergence. See this yellow at the end? This means that I'm sluggish. I, I don't, even after 10,000 iterations, I don't get anywhere close to, to good fit. Now I increase the number of hidden layers. In principle, I should make the problem a lot more complicated, but actually it converges much faster to a, a good solution. You see that I'm already high up there with very uh, few iterations, actually in the hundreds. So something completely un un uh, unintuitive happens. The larger the network, the faster the convergence to a good solution. Now this is something which uh, is a challenge, of course. Okay, what happens here? This is against everything we understand about parameters and so on. And again, the story of the diffusion is precisely what happens. So we are, we are talking about very slow diffusion in, a, in, a, in, a, in an empty space, so this grows like Gaussians, and the entropy grows like the log of the standard deviation, so this grows very slowly. I mean, time is exponential in the increase of entropy. Now, if I do it instead of in one layer, which has to compress a lot, in six parallel compression, which push each other like train because of this Markov chain, I actually enhance the time exponentially in terms of the number of layers. So, so this is my understanding, and it's quite not the common understanding of it. It's not about expressivity. It's not about the fact that those layers can, 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 can implement much more complicated functions. This is true, but it's not the point. The, the main benefit of the story is in this dynamical effect that is up to essentially parallel diffusion. Actually, we notice also something quite interesting. The layers get stuck at some points. Not all the layers converge to the end. So you know, in my past, uh, right after I left Rafi, I did some work on anomalous diffusion in nonlinear systems. And so anomalous diffusion is what happens when diffusion comes into, let's say, phase transition, a critical point in dynamics. And in this, in this region, we know that the, the energy surface, or the free energy surface, is actually very rough, and every barrier, especially entropy barrier, is going to slow the diffusion. So my argument is that those points where the network gets stuck are actually phase transitions in the representation of the problem. And I, I know I don't have enough time, but I just want to convince you that they're actually phase transitions. So if you actually look at the information about the input, 
versus the temperature, which is essentially the slope of the information curve. And both and that, but output and the temperature, or the log temperature, what we see is that there are all those cusps that are special points where the derivative is discontinuous. Now, any physicist or any chemist know that these are phase, second order phase transitions, in the, if, if I think about it as free energy. So what is really interesting is that I know now that those layers that are dominated by diffusion are going to get converged, going to get stuck at points which are just critical slowing down due to the phase transition. So here is a very nice prediction. Take a problem when you can actually calculate the location of these phase transitions and see if the layers indeed converge to this loss. And this is precisely what we see uh, in small problems, of course. So those phase transitions are dominated by bifurcation points of those bottleneck equations. But what is really important is that I now can take the problem only. Give me the joint distribution of input and output as cooked by some sort of rule, and I can predict what a neural network will capture and what each layer will capture. And actually, the nicest examples are examples where you have symmetry in the problem. And when you have symmetry in the problem, which means that there's some transformation, some group that acting on the input doesn't change the label. And if there's symmetry in the problem, you can actually calculate analytically the location of those phase transitions. So OK, of course, it's, I have to make a long story short. So uh, essentially, what I'm saying is that there's a, first of all, machine learning is revolutionized in the way we do science. I mean, it's, and it's much more than curve fitting. And the large scale and big data makes quantitative difference, a qualitative difference, not just quantitative difference. It's a completely different way of thinking. So first of all, it captures rules in a way which we have to think, rethink about our scientific method completely. How we actually combine them with what we understand about learning. On the other hand, the theory of deep learning seems to give us fascinating physics. I mean, it's, these, these are, these are uh, we are back again to understanding of dynamics near phase transitions, uh, bifurcations of very complicated uh, differential equations, so on. Everything seems to affect the way this machine learning works. So this is a challenge for all of you. By the way, after, after, after Dorit's talk, I, I just want to mention that we are actually thinking about quantum machine learning. It's not a joke. Not because we're thinking about computers, but because it turns out that if, if we move from distribution to density functions, density operators, uh, the theory becomes a lot more elegant in many ways. And uh, uh, so actually, even if I'm just going to do it on a classical computer at the end, the quantum machine learning, is, and in particular quantum information bottleneck, is, seems to be a very fascinating story, which brings me back to density matrices and maximum entropy operators and whatever you want. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. So, so, if you, um, so if, I under, if I understand this right, so if you inject noise in the gradients on purpose for a lower number of layers, then it should be beneficial. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but, but uh, if you just inject noise, uniform white noise, uh, you're going to hurt the relevant and irrelevant parts of this problem. Of course, in the lower layers, it's okay, especially if there is some underlying symmetry. Mm -hmm. So if you do, you do convolution neural network or things like this, and you're actually imposing symmetry on the problem, then noise is actually very helpful, and people know that, at least empirically. But what I'm saying is that the actual noise that is generated by stochastic gradient descent is not uniform. It's very strong in the irrelevant directions and very small in the relevant dimension. And this non-uniformity of the noise is actually <coughs> pushing the... SNR, the signal to noise ratio of the irrelevant features of the data to, to disappear, to be filtered away. So essentially, each layer is, is forgetting some aspects of the problem. And this is by this conspiracy because the noise is non uniform and it's precisely eventually related to the Haitian matrix of the error near the minimum. And, and somehow it works perfectly. I mean, so of course, there are some parameters to play with, like the learning rate and many other things. I, I didn't get into such details. So this but, but it's not just white noise. White noise will not do the trick all the way. Right, but it sounds, well, another thing you could do is just do a lossy compression. Right. Partially trained, lossy compression. That's right, that's right. Partially trained. Actually, it's compression by noise. It's compression by stochastic relaxation, which is, by the way, information theoretically very interesting, uh, independent of anything else. Yes. Please. Let me ask two related questions. The fascinating talk with we could go on at great lengths. But one of them is, you say that, that something in the order of it brings new physics. My first question would be, what happens when the physics doesn't cover the science you're trying to deal with, which may be biology? You know, what happens then? 
And it related to this is this question of phase transitions. How well does this handle phase transitions in the data as what happens when your data have a folded bifurcation or something like that as opposed to a phase transition in your learning process? And these are related things, what can be handled and what can be handled, it can't be handled. So I'm yeah, trying to it's, understand it's the a, limitations of what you're talking about. It's an excellent question. Unfortunately, there's a long answer. But the first of all, what are those phase transitions? So it, I just, just to give you one slide of it. So this is essentially the topology the, it's a Tisney, I mean, it's a two-dimensional nonlinear projection of the layer, the first hidden layer on two-dimensional plane. And what I wanted to notice, and this is during the training, again, the dynamics of the training, that the black, which is labeled one, and the red, which is labeled zero in this case, are eventually getting sharper and sharper, which means that the layer knows better and better, and there's some sort of clustering of those, of those points together. But if you look at the topology, this is crazy. There's no simple way to separate the red from the black. If you look at what happened at the fourth hidden layer, and this is the same problem again. In the fourth hidden layer, you see something completely different. The, again, during the iterations of the training, the red is going to the right, and the left is going to the left, and then the, the, the black is going to the left. And, and you see not only that they are separated, but also that the dimension of the representation collapse. This is precisely what we predict. There's a topology, a topological phase transitioning. I mean, things which used to be close by in the first layer geometrically are very far apart now. Topological phase transition cannot happen due to continuous maps. Continuous maps are by definition preserving topology. So there's some transition. And those phase transitions that actually force this dimension reduction is precisely what happens in these cusps of the free energy. So that's essentially the basis of my argument that the layers actually learn they are pushed all the way to the point where a phase transition occurs. Now, your first question is whether, whether there are questions where the physics doesn't meet. So, of course, we're talking about very high dimensional problems which are in some sense universal maps. I mean, they can learn anything. The, the real interesting question about deep learning is not if it can fit the function, but how long does it take? I mean, the time, again, time. And, and, and the, question, the interesting question for me, at least, is whether there is a better way of doing it than the stupid stochastic gradient descent. And if I understand correctly what's going on here, it's the diffusion in this weight space which is winning the game eventually. And which means that fundamentally, in the, again, the language of Dorit, you cannot take it from exponential to polynomial. There's no way of doing it, because this could actually uh, solve many other. So I don't know. I'm not answering you, because this is a long talk. But, but there are many, many interesting issues here. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll take and we're out of time. Question because we're out of time, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So about 100 years ago, Henri Poincaré wrote a book about creativity in mathematics and mathematical discovery. And he argued, as I'm sure you know, there were three steps. There was saturation, there was uh, incubation, and then uh, inspiration. So I wonder if um, the saturation is the same thing as your diffusion. In some sense, it's not really. The diffusion is actually a very active process. It's not just forgetting, it's forgetting what's not important. It's some sort of compression of the relevant representation. So I actually believe that the important part of learning, both in terms of improving the error and in terms of time that it takes to get there, is really this forgetting phase. This, by the way, is a completely radical view of, of machine learning. And that's why most machine learning people don't really believe me, because it's not the empirical risk minimization which makes it doing the trick. It's the, the ability of this to filter out the many other dimensions which are irrelevant to the problem. By the way, so I can tell you a lot about it. I'm not sure I buy this uh, simplified version of uh, discovery that you mentioned, but we don't have time to get into philosophical discussions now. So thank you thank very you, much. Thank you,